What is up, my friends? This is the Protect Your Neck Podcast, and I'm your host, Dan Tom. Analyst is work you could find over at MMA Junkie as well as linemovement.com. But on this here program, the Protect Your Neck Podcast, we break down high level MMA. That's what we're going to do here today, tonight, whenever you're listening to this. Hopefully, it's before the fight as I'm recording this on weigh in day. The fighters have just weighed in, I believe, all successfully just now, at least the ones that count, the main and co main event. So, between that and the status of my voice, we're going to make this an expedited show. Uh, and get through it because it's been um, quite uh, a week. So as per usual, we're going to recap uh, the previous card, a couple quick shouts, a couple quick notes at the top, and then we will start the breakdown UFC 256 from top to bottom as per usual. Check the timestamps on YouTube. Like and subscribe if you're listening to the audio version there. Really could use the subscribers. Thank you. Or on Apple Podcasts, positive rating and reviews are also free and very appreciated. Check the show notes there. Uh, and if you want to spend even less time with me and my raspy voice, which I don't blame you, go all the way to the end of the show. As I always recap all my picks and plays at the very end of the episode, at least for the breakdown shows. Going to have more top five shows coming your way. Been trying to book that amongst this week's madness, but I've actually canceled things just to get work done, despite how late I am for you. That's the kind of week it's been. Actually uh, canceled uh, doctor's appointments of my own uh, just to just to get work done this week. I know, I know. I told I said, uh, coming off the break, I'm supposed to be going to self-care, looking after yourself, Dan, finally. Getting your workouts in, which you didn't get. Getting your sleep in, which you didn't get this week. Um, and, you know, uh, finally, you know, instead of taking everybody else and the animals and the old people and all that stuff to the doctors, maybe checking yourself out because you've been in pain for a while. And, uh, yeah, no, that, that, none of that, none of that happened this week. I'm not asking for, I'm not asking for your sympathies. Uh, <laughs> but, um, it's, uh, yeah, I barely got through this week. So if my attitude didn't seem as upbeat, I apologize. Another reason why we're going to push right through this bad boy. And even though this isn't, this is a new show, it's just, man, again, to attach onto a, no- a note last week, as far as noticing the general vibe of just everybody losing it. Um, and you're seeing a lot of the, uh, overstocked capacity, uh, something you should all keep in mind, by the way, hospitals. Um, a lot of elective stuff's getting canceled. So, I mean, I don't know how much of a rush I am to go address my things anyways for that reason. Uh, and then two, you think with uh, the overwhelming, you think like, you know, a last minute call from a good old polite customer service oriented guy like a Dan Tom, who's actually just calling to cancel and lighten the load of your already busy day would be one of the better calls I would argue you'd get. Um, for all the disrespectful, you know, schmucks out there that you got to deal with, and no, man, I, man, I, I don't know what it is. I, I like, I, I got the the most rudest people that were like were going off on me, medical people, and you know, and, and one of them just did it pretty bad, and it was like they even like I got the real time reaction where I could hear them stumble upon the information where they realized it was actually their their fault, um, and I didn't go off on them, but I, I definitely was just like, you know. What the heck, man? I'm, I'm the nicest person you're going to get on the phone all day. I have, I have family and friends that work in the medical field. Um, I, I, I Believe me, I have sympathy for you people, but it is, boy, the testiness. So have sympathy, have patience for anyone in the medical field right now because I could tell they are going through a lot, boy. Um, and keep that in mind, too, uh, as to why, you know, to be nice and stay safe and all that good stuff. I hope you guys are doing well, by the way. <laughs> your boy here, we're going to push on. Uh, I just wanted to get out there so everyone just, you know, be safe, act accordingly. Let's get through this winter. Let's get this damn vaccine. And we can get back to it, baby. Right? Right? That's what we want. That's the common ground, right? I know. We try to find common ground, even if it's contrarian here on this show. Not popular, but... Oy vey. All right. We're going to move on. Uh, Bellator 254 happened. You know, that was fun, too, to make this week even busier because Bellator loves to, you know slide uh their cards uh you know w- with some quiet important matchups in on really big weeks to get overtaken uh and i'm sure it probably helps in some business fucking end on their metrics i get that okay whatever it's just a pain in the ass because you're splitting the attention of the fighters fans everyone in between uh, the media and uh, you know we're supposed to media and fans are supposed to keep track of the fighters but anyways it's fucking Dunbar's number to the max being tested this year. But I told you, Juliana Velasquez was for real, even though I picked Aleem Malay. I'm sure you could read the 
between the lines um, in my summary, how I wrote it there. It's not very confident. Uh, Vasquez. A little Aliens reference there. Aliens 2. Well, the best Aliens. Uh, fucking... I, I'm still not a fan of Halo or Xbox because the Halo is just a fucking mouth-breathing game where it was just a little bit too much freedom and regeneration and just... I don't know. I did not like, you know, it was it was made for a generation who did not appreciate movies like Aliens because I was yelling at friends going, you don't see that they ripped off the gun, the black general, like everything. Those bastards. Uh, Counter-Strike for life. Um, but yeah, uh, anyways. Dan, where are you going here? Um, <clears throat> yeah, anyways, that, there's my Bell, there's my Bellator. Magomed, Magomedov, there we go. There's my Bellator 254 recap. See how fast we're going to go through this? UFC on ESPN 19. We went three and six overall on picks because this era, like I said last week, is this is par for the course. It's destroying my pick percentages. Uh, the plays have been thankfully getting me through, although they weren't impressive. They only allowed me to break even. The Georgia and Parlay, thankfully, came through with Taporia who, uh, you know, has been, been been good to the line movement family if you've been following along. And uh, Doldis, who almost cashed that plus 800. You look at the way John Allen was limping. You're like, God damn, it was right there. It would have been nice, um, but, uh, yeah, I digress. Uh, 0-1-1 and props because of that, because uh, I almost hit that plus 800. And then 0-3-1, the lone one there was like uh, represents uh, Cody Durden, whose fight got canceled. And um, the rest of the straight plays that I ended up sprinkling on all fell. Um, starting with Jack Hermanson, who fell to Marvin Vittori. Uh, wasn't super confident on that, but just, you know, dog money by fight time. I just ended up taking a little sprinkle. Good on Marvin Vittori. With, uh, he was all baned out, right? I think he really wanted that Bane comparison. Like, he was just smiling and looking like uh, Zane Simons as the Grimace. Nothing can kill the Grimace. Uh, shouts to those of you or, or, the, or the one of you, Aaron Brodstetter, who got that reference from the Clerks animated series. Uh, but I feel like Vittori was really fishing for a Bane comment, and which now reminds me to do my Bane impression, which... I used to have a decent one, which I don't even dare say because I have a terrible voice this week, obviously, from fucking just talking to everybody and their mothers. Um, that I have no voice left for myself to do me an impression when I finally remember it, which sucks. But, uh, but yeah, uh, if anybody, by the way, speaking of bald guys going for that Bane mask, like, I know Dana, I don't think he's still worn a mask once, but, like, if you really wanted to lean into things, you know, the role... I think he should just rock one of those, speaking of bald white dudes, right? He should, he could do the Bane thing. He puts the mask on, especially like we'll get to it, UFC 256. I mean, there's already three fights that are shooting for fight of the night, not including performance bonuses, which means if you do the math, there's going to be the normal criticism. And in this case, especially during the pandemic era and the profit margins, just criticism for not bonusing the fighters properly or going above and beyond, deservedly. Um so, you know, I, I feel like Dana should just, you know, at this point, he should just show up to the press conference, you know. Everyone's expecting a bunch of bonuses. <laughs> he just has the mask going. Yes. You just have to imagine the bonuses. <laughs> Profit rises. <laughs> this is just... Uh, all right, Dana. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, but Vittoria definitely baned out. Got a nice second win. Defeated Jack Hermanson. Um... <clears throat> I apologize for what are already annoying uh, impress, uh, impersonations by our subpar. So I transfer the Scottish one into the old Jamal. Jamal, Jamal, you're for real, Jamal. You can bolt the door and come in now. Sure. Uh, Jamal Hill defeated Owens OSB, Tennessee, Tennessee. Uh, again, rested on his love. <laughs> rested on his <laughs> Jesus Christ. Dude. Uh, yeah, man, OSP just looked bad. It was a bad sign with the weight miss. Um, I thought that was a flag, not that Jamal couldn't have won anyways. Really impressed with Jamal again. I, this was one of those picks where even if Jamal lost, I would have told you all, like, don't discount this kid. So uh, I'm not trying to play after the fact or be revisionist history. I did pick wrong. But uh, I in no way was disrespecting Mr. Jamal Hill. Although he's got a bit of an ego on him, does he, Jamal? Yeah, she is. She's a confident one. We'll see how far he can climb. Um, I don't know why. Creepy Mr. Connery. Um, wow. 
again, way to pay tribute to a recently deceased celebrity who you uh, like, Dan, make him into a pedophilic bigot. Wow, that is what we do on this show. Gabriel Benitez defeated Justin Janes. That was a segue. Um, <clears throat> fan of Gabe Benitez, despite him, d- d- despite him uh, beating my dude Justin Janes. Uh, just a tough matchup, man. Just a tough matchup. Tough matchup for Justin. Uh, and, you know, uh, Gabe's always been a good counter striker. Like that uppercut. The knee. Uh, and, you know, and it felt for him, man. It's been a tough year for that guy. And, and you know, lost his coach and, you know, the emotional post fight. So. Even though I felt for my guy, I was happy for Benitez. Dolidze defeated John Allen. Saved our night. Um, Jordan Levitt saved nobody, knocking Matt Wyman into the oblivion with a slam. I was happy to be wrong. Luis Smoker defeated uh, Jose Quinones. Was happy to be wrong there. Good job, Mr. Schmoker. Uh, Aaliyah Torpiria defeated Walt Goggins. Damon Jackson. Now you cannot unsee. Um, Jake Collier stepped up and got a old, uh, I forgot to give credit to another Brad Taschuk nickname, uh, Pasta Gianni. Pasta Gianni. Uh, call, you know, a t-shirt in the pool division by Brad there. We're going to have him on the podcast probably sooner than later. Uh, it's just some bookings. Uh, I won't give away our topic uh, quite yet, but, uh, you know, we'll, 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 it'll be another, it'll be another, uh, Another cool, uh, another one for the cool kids there. You guys, y'all enjoy. Um, and that was it. Okay, how do we do on the time? Twelve minutes, not too bad for an expedited edition, right? Okay, let's go forward uh, to UFC. Oh, actually, you know what? Not, not quite yet. Uh, real quick, um, Amazon reads. Thank you guys for uh, supporting the show. I know, I'm sounding all sour shit. Uh, Want to give a couple quick shouts, real quick, to. Um, the Fight Sight Podcast, uh, have me on at Gallo, Sharam, uh, Ben, uh, Agent Ben uh, has been on this podcast as well. Uh, it was all real fun breaking down um, Tony Chuck Olives uh, in depth. Um, John Hyun Ko, of course, subscribe to his channel, follow him uh, on Twitter. Um, he had me on his show uh, for the South uh, China Morning Post, which you can also follow at CSCMP MMA. Uh, with uh, Nick Atkin over there. Uh, so uh, make sure you give all of them a follow, support their work. Always great talking to my brother from across the uh, across the world, a, a fellow Asian brother in the media. Not that many of us, man, got to represent. So uh, very happy uh, uh, to finally uh, link up with my dude there. And speaking of links, thank you guys for hitting the on it links, as well as the Amazon links, which uh, Amazon... Um, it's much easier to ow, read off the the items. It doesn't tell you tell me who bought it. Um, so your guys' privacy is protected. So when I'm reading off your items, like so, if you hear, you know, someone bought a ultra vibration max and you start sweating, don't worry, I'm not gonna out you. Whatever you're into, I'm just gonna name the item and pontificate and pretend, uh, you know. Just enjoy the kind of listeners that I'm attracting on this here program. But no, honestly. Um, not sure where you guys come here every week. I, I as much as I complain about uh, <laughs> my measly uh, YouTube uh, subscribership, and uh, you know, and now that I'm getting podcast analytics, uh, not as good as I, I like to. You know, I have very I have very low expectations as I do with everything, but even that instead, you know, maybe not as good as I wanted. But you know, what? instead of getting down about those things, um, let's appreciate the people who are there and are helping man, because seriously it helps a lot and it doesn't cost you guys anything and you really have to do very little. So, um, the fact that y'all just really commit to that in this day and age when you can go to many other links, I'm sure many other podcasts, my goodness, do I appreciate you guys. Of course, those links can be found at mixedmarshallanalyst.com, uh, the host of here, this year program, uh, you just go to the right, and there is a link for on it. There's a link for Amazon. You do all your normal shopping, and at the no cost, no extra clicks other than that click itself, um, a small percentage gets kicked back to the show. Someone bought Chaos Monkeys, Obscene Fortune, and Random Failure in Silicon Valley. Billion Dollar Loser, The Epic Rise and Spectacular Fall of Adam Newham. I wanted to say Nuremberg, but that was the uh, the Jewish trial, right? Um Newman and WeWork. 
Flash Crash, a trading savant, a global manhunt, and the most mysterious market. The new, new thing, a Silicon Valley history. I think I think y'all are uh, going into the uh, entrepreneurial thing, you know? Really, really getting your, your groove on in the tech world. I appreciate that. Sounds like a, someone who's much smarter than me is buying all these, by the way, so... No hate here. No funny jokes here. <laughs> I'm wishing you luck. A breath. The new science of a lost art. Advances in financial machine learning. I mean, this is shit that I probably need to read, to be honest. The And this is another great thing about the link. You guys are giving me ideas here. Uh, so it's about the art of doing science and engineering. Learning to learn. Yeah, yeah. I could definitely use some of that. Uh, Flonase allergy relief na nasal spray. Uh, I, I I do use that and haven't used it in a while. A while. Uh, perhaps I could, right? Uh, getting a little stuff stuffed up. Don't want people thinking I've got the the, the COVID. You know, maybe maybe I've been been using it less because I don't want my I don't want my passages to be open. I don't don't want the COVID coming in. I, I don't need that thought out in there. And I'm sorry, I don't need to pass that on to you. Thank you. Keep buying Flonays. Don't listen to my conspiracy theory thoughts out that slip out loud sometimes. Parm Crisp Original Keto Snack. Ooh. These sound really good. Parm crisps. It sounds like the stuff that you could put on your salad, like croutons. Uh, and whereas Dan Tom, instead of eating the salad as a kid, I would just eat the croutons. May or may not do that now at restaurants. Uh, algorithmic training with with Python. Is that a masturbation book? Dan, relax. Not everything is phallic. Quantitative, me quantitative methods and strategy development. See, it's not about fapping, Dan. Dog squeaky toys, three piece, stuffy chewy to oh buying the dog. I gotta get my doggy some new toys. They have been tearing theirs up. All right, and that, that that does it for this week's Amazon links. Um if I didn't get to yours, uh, I probably just missed it, but feel free to hit me up anyways, just to make sure if you'd like. Thank you guys for hitting the link through uh click throughs. Um which you can find at mixedmarshallanalyst.com where there is a PayPal link if you just want to donate to the podcast straight up. All right, now let's get to the breakdown here. The time is 17. Wow, Jesus Christ, 56. All righty. We're going to get through this uh, pretty fast, though, hopefully. I'd like to think. Um, starting off at the top, UFC 56 headline by Davison Figueredo, minus 320. Brandon Moreno, plus 260. Main and co-main event I've got in-depths on. Um, you know, uh, at MMAJunkie.com, as per usual. I suggest you check out those. I actually put some gifts and some stuff in the Ferguson one. So, you know, trying to do that a little bit more. Um, but, yeah, uh, Figueredo... He's been sitting at minus 300. Even more money's coming in because, you know, he's Davison Figueredo, a god of war, baby. Um, I'm picking him here. He's the deserved favorite. I'm not going to call him Figgy Smalls because that's a disrespect to hip hop, uh, Biggie Smalls, rest in peace, and just anybody with taste because, uh, you know, Figueredo's a great fighter, but uh, his taste, you know, questionable, right? That's fair. Um, especially because, like, you know, it just, I, I, Michael Chiesa's, you know, I like Michael Chiesa. He deserves full credit, by the way, for the Figgy Smalls nickname, which is clever. It just doesn't make sense when we anoint the guy the nickname when he's facing a dude who actually is a Biggie Smalls fan and comes out to Biggie Smalls, whereas Figueredo worships the guy who fucking represents the most irreputable uh, era of hip-hop and arguably brought it down to a crash. Um, ushering in this fucking generation of, uh, you know, entitledness. Find me in the club, would you die trying? Like, that's the fucking message you want to send? Fucking ass. Um, you can go fight for any, and 50 Cent's in MMA anyways. Like, he's already connected, he's alive, and he's connected to MMA, and that's Figueredo's favorite guy. So, you know, I, I know he can't, you know, go into Bellator and, you know, get, you know, the bottle of the Shem de Wad jerked off on his face that, you know, 50 Cent loves to do at the end, which is really awkward when he does it to, like, stone face killers like Douglas Lima, you know? Douglas Lima's like, what do I do? Do I let him just shoot me in the face with this? Like, it's just really awkward, and it's like the pandemic era, so they're, like, they're filming it in the back, and he's by himself, and I'm like, can you imagine that? You just win a fight, and you're just like, all right, where's my willing dollars? Like, hold on, hold on. Uh, the, the, this washed up uh, uh, crappy rapper has to go spray some really shitty alcohol over your face in a really suggestive fashion, but you'll be paid. Um, not hating on Bellator or Lima or anybody, just any shot to take on 50 Cent. Um, little 2003 Dan Tom rant coming out there. You know, shit that I've been holding on to for 17 years, real healthy. 
Um, so that, that's why I don't like the Figgy Smalls name. It's not because I don't like Figueredo, folks. Relax. Um, oh, my God, though. I mean, I'm just glad he got cleared. I mean, the amount of dick jerking this guy's been going through the past three weeks. Again, even people that, you know, proverbially that are just on the Figgy train and, like, even the, even those people, like, were doubting that, like, he was going to make weight. And even when I picked against him, uh, which I didn't hear, uh, but either this time or the last time, I've never questioned, I, I didn't question the guy's weight as much as everybody else did, man. Um, it just was more about, you know, I just want to see more of the guy, man. And the good news about this matchup is I think we can see that. Um, to me, this is dog or pass, even though I'm picking Figueredo because the line is super wide. And <clears throat> again, I didn't think the weight was going to be an issue, but the undeniable and tangible that perhaps we're trying to get a beat on or you should be at least focusing in on is the turnaround, having to peak twice within one month time. I mean, this fight could come down to not even styles. You know, I focused in styles in the last time and it ended up being the latter. I said it's the capitalization on Chaos and Figueredo or it's the Bad Styles matchup. Uh, Perez started to show that Bad Styles matchup, but Figueredo just capitalized on the Chaos. And good on him, but it was, it, you know, it, I, I warn people overvaluing that. I feel like, it's more criminal to overvalue the guillotine than it was to have been outright wrong like I was about the pick, right? Uh, picking the other guy because I am, you know, and nothing against, you know, I'm not hating on anybody, by the way. I, I, I you know, fucking if anybody is friendly and shows respects to, pe uh, you know, other people in the space, um, it's me or doesn't, you know, maybe take shots in the low hanging fruit as much as I can or should. Um, but like just seeing the talk about the guillotine, building it up. I think I even saw like some Zapruta f f uh, footage like going down. I'm like, folks, there's a guillotine. Like it, it was such a weird sample size. Like it was kind of low percentage. Perez kind of made a mistake, but Figueroa also kind of really didn't even have it at first and arguably shouldn't have got it still. Like it was just was so weird. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, I, again, just like I said with the fight site guys, who I always enjoy breaking it down with them, um, like I think we were split. Two of us were on Perez, two of us were on Figueredo, but I think we all agree. We're like, we just want to see more. And I think that is the good news here because Moreno is durable, um, is going to be harder to submit, uh, I believe so, and also by the record, right? Um, and with both guys being hard to control or submit and both guys being durable as all hell, I feel like the over two and a half is super live here. Um I didn't get it at plus money, although I think it never went there. I think it opened right at that minus 105 where I got it. Uh, over 2.5, minus 105. I put a unit on that. Um, I, I picked Figueredo by decision. I wasn't ballsy enough to play the decision prop. Or if fight goes the distance, maybe I'll sprinkle. But I feel like the over is a nice middle ground to where if even if Figueredo is able to get some type of club and sub sort of deal, it's not going to be till later. And I hope we get to see more of his gas tank and management, man. Uh, whereas Moreno, uh, I really like his renaissance. He should be riding a 5-0 and winning streak. You know, he, he beat Asker Askarov, let's be honest. I know I pick on Asker with that, but it's the truth. Um, Moreno, you know, uh, his offensive wrestling, he's got level-changing shots. I'll be curious if he can stay out of guillotines when he goes to those. I like him in scrambles. Uh, I like his left hook. It's going to be left hook versus right hand, but, you know, Figueredo will be tricky in check when he switches stances, but look for Moreno's variated left hook. Uh, likes lead side uh, kicks. Uh, some interesting stuff there, but yeah, I really like the over here. And I warn anybody just, again, even though I'm picking Figueredo here, I still warn people getting getting too high for the number and, you know, and, and, and for the... Uh, uh, for the hype, I'm just always always weird of that this is a flyweight fight. Brandon Moreno has that upset potential, folks. Like this got trap this got trap fight written all over it. Um, and again, even like staunch Figueroa uh, supporters, like uh, uh, the Dan Levies of the world, who obviously I respect. Like even he is like, yo, I'm not as confident this time around. You know what I'm saying? So that that should tell you something, folks. Um, but yeah, that's my pick there. All right, Tony Ferguson minus 165, Charles DuBronx Oliveira plus 145. Um, yeah, man, Tony Ferguson looks, you know, with the bald look, he looks even older, which probably only j drives that narrative even further of he's falling apart. Uh, again, in short, I don't think he's prime. I think he's past prime. However, I don't think he's completely shot either. Um, the speculation of how he looked against Cowboy in round one 
to the Justin fight, I, I don't know if that's enough to make any confident things, especially considering um, the Cowboy fight was coming off of his most inconsistent years, right? Because he had all the personal plus injuries and like another year layoff. Like, yeah, I was, you know, Tony's not exactly the most fastest starter. So, like, yeah. Was it really that crazy for him to not look at his best in a round that I still had him winning and I still felt that people largely from commentary to otherwise over blue Cerrone's success? I, I don't think it's as troublesome. I think it's worthy of bringing up and it's smart to bring up for those who have brought it up, not hating. I just feel like maybe it's also been overblown. We'll see, right? Uh, it's always easy to say after the fact. You know, uh, and then we go, what? Then there's a decent space to his next fight, which is UFC 249. One of the most weirdest fights in that pandemic era because it's right at the beginning. You know, it's when everybody, the, the, the fear was at the highest. Nobody knew what was going on. He had multiple opponent switches. All these things going on with Tony. And we had the worst-looking Tony Ferguson, the best-looking Justin Gaethje, who was already awesome and we all already hold in high regard. And even though everyone's recency bias seemed like crazy, like, oh, he's, he got his sprungs and sprockets knocked out. We can't put Tony back together again. Humpty Dumpty fell down. Like, Humpty Dumpty on his bad day almost fucking finished that fight in the second round. Page note that. That uppercut happens just 30 seconds or so earlier. Um, Tony Ferguson's winning streak is still alive. Uh Tony Ferguson, the worst Tony Ferguson, still almost beat the best Justin Gaethje. So, again, it's all perspective here. I, uh, not saying that Tony Ferguson is, is, is you know, is prime. He's past prime. Not saying he's going to win. He could lose. But I still think that people are overblowing those narratives because that's the thing we do. It's all recency bias, right? Especially a guy like Tony. He doesn't do himself any favors, granted. You know, as I was saying, like, doesn't matter what you could say. You could just be, like, totally nice to this guy, and he's just going to fucking come at you. <laughs> I think I was listening to him do, try to do that to my guy, Aaron Bronstetter. Aaron, like, sets him up with, like, this most amazing compliment, and I'm like, don't do it, Aaron. Don't do it. Tony's not going to take the compliment. He's going to get indignant and fucking turn it around on you and talk crap about all of us and all that we're getting paid by proper 12 or whatever. And he'll say stupid stuff. Like, that's Tony Ferguson. Like, I get that if you don't want to like him or his style, that's totally fine. But let's not pretend this is new. Let's not pretend fighters in general playing mind games with other fighters is something new. Let's not pretend that Tony Ferguson taking pride in making weight, right, is something new. It's clearly not new. He takes more pride than anybody, right? Remember him making weight when he didn't need to, factor that into, uh, you know, your perception of Tony in that fight, right? For UFC 249. Um, you know, so everybody's freaking out about this post, like, oh, the, look at Tony's, you know, and, you know, even my own outlet posted something like, oh, it looks like the, uh, the, the pullout threat, you know, or however we want to characterize this. And, of course, everybody's just like, oh, fuck Tony, fuck Tony. Because it's, it's such a gut reaction, right? Like, you could see it coming from a mile away. And I'm just laughing because I'm like, like, this is the terrorist Masu guy. This is the weigh-in when I don't need to weigh-in guy. Like, uh, are y'all really, like, taking it that seriously? Like, the guy who's been screwed over by the system, and yeah, he hasn't showed up when he had freak fucking injuries, but, like, it's well documented how unlucky this guy is, how he did show up when no one else was wanting to show up at UFC 249. So it's funny how, again, you don't have to like the guy as a person, as a fighter, and you don't have to pick the guy here. But it still doesn't change the fact that these narratives are being unfairly overblown and that people can conveniently pull all the negatives from the UFC 249 sample size and can conveniently not mention any of the positives. And I'm sure there's podcasts out there that are. I haven't listened yet. Um, just from the conversations I've taken part on or from what I've seen in my timeline on Twitter, right? Um... So it's funny, you know what I'm saying? And then as if I've already said enough on that piece on why people shouldn't even have blinked, have blinked twice at that stupid statement and gotten rolled up on it, like, you know, tricks on you. Um, but, like, it also tricks on you because you're doing that shit that, like, we all complain about, about people not reading. Because if you read his post, <laughs> he says to Charles and others, like, 
it seemed like a general pose. It would seem like it was more directed to the general population, a general statement than anybody else. And with the amount of shit that's happened to this guy and the opponent change, him being burned to the nth degree, right? Doing a thankless thing in, in the pandemic era in the beginning when it's most scariest and most fucking thankless to be doing. You have the most impressive win streak regardless of fucking division. You're putting that on the line plus title plus title that you fucking have, have won twice already and nobody wants to give you credit because, you know, they're, they're too busy jerking Khabib off into a goddamn Dixie cup. Like, <laughs> really? We're going yeah, to give that guy shit. Crazy Tony. Oh, Crazy Tony. Do you, you believe he's talking about making weight again? And, and by the way, like, when fighters go, like, making weight is the Bible, usually we're like, yeah, fuck yeah, that's right. That's right, you do make weight, you know? Paul Felder went on his thing. Everybody, from fans to fighters alike, we're all, we, all got, we all got it. We all got how important that is to make weight, right? Like, fucking come on. And I get it, and, and I get it. You know, Bronx doesn't get enough love. And our guy who has been, you know, is... May, probably made you a lot of money if you've been betting the Du Bronx by sub. Uh, you know he's a hardcore fan favorite for a reason. I like Du Bronx. You know I'm glad he's getting stuck up for. But like let's let's not pretend the sky isn't fucking blue, folks. Anyways, I just wasted more time on that. But again, you know Dan Tom, he's got to stick up for the arguments that are unpopular um, that you aren't hearing anywhere else. And you know, <laughs> crazy enough, I'll, I'll bring facts behind my shit. But hey. We'll see. Uh, the fact is, we don't know who's going to win, right? Uh, Tony is favorite to win at minus 165. Hopefully, um, the continual negative spiral around him continues to grow. And him looking all old and bald and with a shaved head at the weigh-ins gets a better line because I'm on the verge of playing him straight up. But I believe that the under is the best way to go. Uh, minus 2.5. Um, minus 2.5, uh, minus 160. Um, is a nice middle ground. Pretty much the same price, if not cheaper price, of playing Ferguson straight up, which, again, I'm considering doing. And it gets coverage because I think Oliveira has to get it done early uh, or not. You know, he can fight tired. I saw um, Ed Gallo post something uh, with uh, the help of Snack Moy on Twitter. Uh, and, by the way, speaking of Ben Conn, he, he posted a, a sweet video breakdown on the fight site. I haven't got to check it out yet on Charles Oliveira's game that uh, I can guarantee is worth checking out. He did it, um, but uh, but yeah, man, Oliveira does. You know, get he's better at fighting more tired. Um, in the David T. Moore fight, we have seen him overcome through adversities, but um, win or lose, revised Oliveira or not, one forty five or one fifty five, Oliveira that's made weight or Oliveira that's missed weight, he consistently slows and starts to fade come the second round. And I paged out the second round for Tony earlier because even at Tony's worst performance, him having his best time in his second round was not a coincidence because Tony usually has his best rounds in the second round. And I know Charles Oliveira has a bunch of second round finishes, so you're like, what the hell are you talking about, Dan? Uh, it's, again, it's the resume. It's that There's a difference between reading off a resume and actually reading a fight and reading the momentum of a fight. And Chucky Olive's momentum always tends to start fading in that second round. So... Um, if if he's not able to 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 get something going in the first half of the fight, I think Oliveira falls apart to Ferguson's pace, pressure, and underrated wrestling. So give me Ferguson here. Um, good luck to you, Oliveira. Better straight up. I, I don't blame you. Uh, over is uh, middle ground there for those in the middle. All right. Um, Mackenzie Dern is minus one ninety. Verna Jenny Droba uh, plus one sixty five. She uh, robs from the rich. She steals from the poor. She's got good bow and arrow. Uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm breaking down Verna based off her Robin Hood hat. No, uh, she's a really a good jiu-jitsu age. She's got multiple jiu-jitsu championships, both Brazilian and world, which I didn't look into what those were. I know Dern has actually like competed in Ogi and against more notable names than Verna, um, but I didn't go to Verna's. I uh, review Verna's like BJJ Heroes list to go see Refresh myself on her jujitsu resume. Um, she's arguably submission or bust. Or has got to be able to control the girl the whole time. I don't think she's going to be able to control Dern. I don't think Dern's going to tire. Even out of shape Dern didn't tire. Um, this new revised in shape Dern um, I think will be much better. She's been working with Jason Perillo. Hopefully I think still. Unless something happened again. 
Um, and kind of like my man Dan said on Line Movement MMA betting show, which I was totally out of sorts again. Sorry, folks. I, I barely slept or ate in three days, and then I slept decently the night before last, and then I'm on an hour and a half now. It's been a crazy week. Um, still didn't do much tape on this one, but I will take Dern. Um, probably going to be by decision. Uh, and hopefully we get some fun jujitsu uh, exchanges. All right, Ronaldo Souza speaking of jujitsu minus one twenty, Kevin Holland plus one hundred despite the smack man uh, being open at minus one seventy five. Both are recovering from COVID. Uh, I get liking Souza, who I lean toward, and after watching the tape, stuck with my pick, which is why the money came in on him and has stayed on him as he is now a favorite. Um, that being said, I don't blame any, it's one of those fights where, you know, take a shot where you see the plus money. Uh, although you could argue, you know, Souza minus 120 may look like a steal in hindsight once this is all said and done, folks. I mean, I know he's 41 years old and I know Kevin Holland's had momentum and Kevin Holland, by the way, has done really well for the line movement family, cashing pretty much almost every time out we played him, um, this pandemic era, but. You know, his counter wrestling is not the greatest. You know, Darren Stewart was able to get him down in that small cage. Brandon Allen was able to get him down. He was even able to give up scrambles and stuff when he was able to get out of bad positions from Brandon Allen and almost kind of gave himself back into it. Um, positions and 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 uh, plays that will get him in big trouble against Souza even at this stage of Souza's career. Um, don't be fooled by Souza's low percentage. Again, it's sample size, folks. You can't go off, off stats all the time anyways, like I always say. Secondly, if you are going to look at those UFC.com stats, keep in mind it's only the UFC fights. So you're getting a guy with Jacare who's got like stats going back from the Strike Force days to a guy like Holland who has fought a lot this year but has only been fighting for a couple of years, folks, in the UFC under the stat regime there, that tracking. So you're not getting – you're getting slanted stats. And second of all, Souza is going to have a low percentage because he, A, goes for takedowns a lot. B, he's one of those guys like Khabib in the sense of he uses, he's okay with failing on his first shot because Souza just wants to push you to the cage, which comes in handy when you're fighting in the small cage, huh? Huh? Um, and that we've seen Kevin, Kevin Holland get pushed there before. So unless Souza is too content with his slipping on the outside, which he does tend to do and can be very dangerous here, he can get sniped, as Kevin Holland said in interviews. He's going to look to snipe. Kevin Holland, if you're following the middleweight matchmaking trend that of the mix-up between Vittori and Hermanson, um, has the least adjusting to do, right? He's facing another orthodox grappling submission specialist, just like Vittori, who won. So by that theory... Maybe we should be going with Holland here because he's having to adjust less. He's the younger guy. That's the common thread between the corresponding shakeup matchup that happened the week prior with Vittori and Hermanson, right? Looking for parallels. Uh, however, Souza looks to be in good shape, made, made, made uh, the scales okay. And when I look back at him, he didn't even look flabby at the 205. He looked filled out. He looked pretty energetic. Um, it was just a weird fight, you know what I'm saying? And against a guy who, up a division, against a guy who is now the champion, Jan Blakovich. So, I mean, you look at how Souza was able to do compared to how, like, a Dominic Reyes was able to do, then, you know, not that that should make sense on MMA math. It doesn't. I'm not hanging my hat on that. But I'm just saying, like, it, it wasn't as condemning as I thought, you know? But you look at the losing streak, Souza's old, and we do that recency bias, right? The recency bias is so strong. But we don't know where Suze is at. You know, he definitely wasn't himself coming into the Hermanson fight and still pushed through. Um, and then, again, it's hard to know what to do with the 205 sample size. So, in the small cage, he says, you know, instead before that he was going to get back to grappling, uh, to his grappling roots, which I liked. He wasn't able to do that against Jan for the aforementioned reasons. Jan big, Jan underrated wrestling, Jan now a champion, Jan up at 205, etc. I don't know if Holland presents that same problem. Um, so if you're looking, still looking for a plus money, I actually took Souza by submission because I feel like that's his path here. I think he can win a decision, um, but it'd be sketchy if he's in there with Souza for that long. And uh, <laughs> the dog's leaving. I think my my mother got back here from uh, her therapy, so the dogs are gonna be a little bit. It's okay. I'm gonna keep keep rolling. Um, but yeah, man, uh, I, I'll take, uh, I'll take Sousa by submission. I got out of plus two, 225. You want to shop around cause there's big variance on those numbers. 
Uh, multiple places still have it at the north of plus 200, though. Sousa by submission. I think we get it here. And then we're like, oh, he should retire. And then, of course, he won't. And then he'll get brutally knocked out his next fight. Because such is MMA. Um, all right. Um, last fight on the main card, I guess. Uh, Cyril Gaon, minus 425. Junior DeSantos, plus 340. Um, I know it's popular. Totals are everywhere, as I've already given you guys my totals um, this week. Uh, but uh, that's honestly, I, it's kind of hard to blame everybody ending up on the same spots uh, this week. Uh, that is, in, in fact, where we are, because uh, I know my man Aaron B. on TSN Edge, as I was listening to the TSN MMA show, said he was on this over as well, and I agree with him, the over 1.5 here. Um, I know Dos Santos can be winning until he loses, hence that last fight. But even going back, you know, even a guy like Jarzinho, who, you know... <laughs> Still not sold on here nor there. Uh, I'm glad that fight happened. It'll give us a good line on Jarzinho in the future. Rosenstrach! Um, but um, even Jarz, like, Ghani doesn't have one-punch knockout power. Not that he can't one-punch knockout a guy. Obviously, he's a heavyweight. But he doesn't show it in the same way, even when he's fighting, like, really overweight um, bad guys on the TKO scene. Uh, it takes, like, plethora and barrages of punches. And, like, you go to that first round, even though DeSantis uh, won it on many scorecards... Like, Rosenstruck hit him with some good shots. Rosenstruck hit him with, I think, before he... First of all, he knocks him out with a flurry of multiple shots that include th at least four shots to the back of the head, okay? That's the finishing sequence. He, he, he's... Rosenstruck's more of a one-punch knockout guy than Gane, okay? And even he did one-punch knockout Gene DeSantos. He needed a flurry with, again... Four illegal strikes. Even before Flurry with the four illegal strikes, Rosenstruck landed literally eight to ten um, significant shots to the Santos' head. Um, and that fight still hit the. You know, if we're betting the same bet for that fight, we would have cashed it. Um, that fight still went over. So if De Santos can survive there, I think he can survive here. Um, it'll be interesting to see because both guys like to move, so that might give them some pause. It's a small cage, heavyweights, they'll have less room to move, but the fact that they both like to uh, will be something. Again, uh, Blagoy, I like boy. Even off, went five rounds in the small cage with um, Dos Santos. And I know he's got the crazy chin, but you know he, he landed some hard shots too, and Dos Santos' his chin held there. Dos Santos looks like he's fully doctored up. Uh, even at the wide number that shouldn't be this wide for a heavyweight fight with proven products. I still can't touch Dos Santos. I still don't trust him against these young up-and-comers. His confidence is just, oh, it's going to be the death of him, man. So um, I, I like Gane. I like his shifts. Uh, it's really clever shifts, and he draws guys and it checks. Don't think he gets his ground game going, though, because of Dos Santos' takedown defense. Um... Wouldn't be surprised if he finishes him, but uh, I'm actually going to pick Gunny by decision, even though I didn't play that. I played the over here, over one and a half. Um, next fight, Rafael Fizzi at minus 150. Hinata Moicano, plus 130. Demoted from the main card, but a main card in all of our hearts, right? At least those of us who know what we're watching, because this should be fun, technical stuff. Moicano have admittedly had a bad read on folks, so I'm going to say it's probably dog or pass here. Best of luck to you if you're the dog. He definitely has more ways to win. Um, as my co-host Dan Levy uh, smartly brought up, we should be, regardless if he wins, regardless if you're picking him, regardless if you're playing him, I think we should all give Moicano some room, though, um, the, to improve, like Dustin Poirier did moving up in weight. Uh, he is a big guy, man. He is big enough to be a lightweight. Um, he's a huge featherweight, and, you know, people want to say that theory that could have hindered his chin, and we could see a better lightweight. For that reason, I don't blame them. I've interviewed this guy in person. He is big. The reason why, one of the reasons why, aside from my bad read and maybe just not being the biggest fan of his style, uh, Moicano is because he doesn't have the physicality, athleticness, explosiveness, KO power enough. He didn't have it for my liking at 145, which is why I was picking aging. Um, suspect durability guys at that point of their careers, like Chancellor and Jung or Aldo. To beat him, and that they that they did, because they were good at they also because they were specifically good at countering a jab. And Fiziev can counter some fucking jabs. He loves jabs. He slips them like second nature, and kind of akin to um, 
the heavyweight Gane actually, he loves throwing checks from either stance. Uh, coming forward, or he'll throw forward, forward hooks off a southpaw, but he can check off of his op- opposing southpaw stance too. Like, Fiziev can do it all, man. Um, so I ended up keeping my Fiziev pick, even though I was almost talked into the Moicano fight pick, which could be right here. Good luck to you guys. Um, I haven't played Fiziev, uh, although I may if the line gets any tighter. It went down to minus 140. I like that. Keep going down, baby. Back to almost pick him, right, where it opened, but uh, money coming back up. Um Fiziev can wrestle. I really like his wrestling. And Moicano, he can wrestle better than I remembered. He hits some change. He does some good things. But again, just like his striking, just that athletic umph and explosion is lacking there. Like, that's why the takedowns he is hitting, they have to be perfectly timed with guys like Stevens running into him, which doesn't happen with more skilled guys like Fiziev, like Ala Shevchenko, who he has ties to, Ala Aldo, who I just mentioned. These more skilled Muay Thai fighters, they seldom throw themselves out of position, folks, which means hitting level change in doubles are going to be harder, especially if they're well-schooled in wrestling, which Fiziev is. He trains at Tiger Muay Thai, which, of course, is run by American uh, wrestlers, um, the Hickman brothers. And Fiziev's got incredible balance, which is more stout nature. Yeah, maybe he could make 145, but, boy, this guy seems freaking strong. At 155, and I like his short, stout nature, especially in a matchup against a tall guy who might want to take him down. He's really going to have to be leaning into those uppercuts and uh, power zone of Fiziev in general. Moicano is. And even when Moicano gets his level change, you can tell he doesn't have the driver power because you look at the T City Ortega one. Like the reason, aside from Ortega being Ortega, uh, you know, having that opportunistic stuff like Figueredo. But it was actually a real similar finish, even though a different setup to the Perez Figueredo. Go look at uh, or T City Ortega because it's a guillotine that happens where the guy commits his head behind the armpit, thinking he's safe, not realizing there's a wrap over guillotine counter right around the corner, right? And the reason why, aside from Ortega self admittedly training for it, but you can see he actually has a time to adjust because. Moicano initially hits a really strong angle that should make it hard for him to, to even regard or face him, much less hit a guillotine. But when he chains and turns the corner, it's so slow and non-athletic that Ortega is allowed to kind of just turn and face him as the takedown is happening, which is really bad. Um, for a guy to be able to maneuver that much in general. Uh, so I'm not sure he's going to get fizzy of down, in other words. I like Hadzovic, but Hadzovic wasn't a litmus test for 155. Moicano's also recovering from COVID, so I don't know if he's going to pull away late. Um, and I'm almost positive he's not going to knock out Fiziev. So it's submission or bust. Um, you could argue it's underdog or bust, but I may play Fiziev if he gets tighter. So I'm just not sold on Moicano, but I don't blame people for playing the dog or it being dog or pass. Um because Moicano could certainly take Fiziev's back if he does get him down or in a scramble, and it's big trouble for Fiziev in that case. Don't get it twisted, folks. And that's the reason why I'm frustrated with Moicano, because he actually is a really good back taker and jiu-jitsu guy, and then he just came in and started point fighting, and judges have been moving away from point fighting. So we'll see where Moicano ends up. Good luck to you if you played it. Daniel Pineda, minus 160. Cub Swanson, plus 140. Um, I'm rooting for Cub here, but I'm taking Pineda. I'm probably going to play Pineda if he drops anywhere below minus 160 because, you know, you do Pineda inside the distance or fight doesn't go the distance or decent angles here, folks, um, because he's so uh, do or die. And if Cub Swanson even, you know, has a resurgence at 37, and I'd be happy for it because I'm a Cub fan. But, uh, you know, Pineda is so do or die, and Cub puts on such a pace and fights at such a pace, and so does Pineda that, yeah, I feel like it's do or die here, but I think that Pineda is going to get the fight that he wants in the scrambles because he's not just a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt who's underrated, as we saw in the Herbert Burns fight, um, which, by the way, Herbert missed weight, so you don't know what was going on with Herbert there too, right? You got to be careful, but Pineda's, you know, he's game. He's going to do his job, win or lose. You, he'll fight for your money. Um, and I think that he's going to, the small cage is going to give him the scrambles and he's got some decent wrestling too. People forget about, um, and that's not been a strong suit of cub wrestling or submission. So, uh, if Pineda can avoid being cut up too badly or knocked out, 
um, which he's only been knocked out once, which was a weird one because he took that fight on short notice. Even And he also took his last fight on short notice too, folks, so go figure. Uh, but that was back in 2012 against Antonio Carvalho. And I'm like, what the hell happened to this guy, dude? This guy was like a really like, he beats him and knocks him out, like a perfect shot. It's like super emotional. And I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry, that's like that's the Canadian uh, – jiu-jitsu guy who got good at kickboxing and he had bazooka joe valtellini who he credited in the post-fight interview i'm like oh this was a bazooka joe guy so aaron i know you're listening if i don't remember to ask you on the tsn mma on the pre-show on your on your periscope follow aaron folks on twitter um ask bazooka joe for me what happened to antonio carvalho he's 41 now granted but i mean he only fought once more after he beat Pineda, and so i think he retired at like 31 or 32 he tried to come back two years later at the WSOF, and the bout was canceled. Doesn't list why. So uh, homework, as I speak through podcasts, through Aaron Bronstetter. But yeah, I think Pineda gets the fight he wants here, so I don't blame. I think, you know, especially uh, gambling Twitter, sadly, is already on it. You could tell because gambling Twitter loves, even though Pineda is like 35, he's not, not a spring chicken himself, like uh, my man Dan Levy was reminding y'all. But like, gambling Twitter in general loves, you know, fading old, older dudes. They're, they're I mean, uh, their dick gets hard when there's an old dude that could be faded. And when there's a guy that could be hyped, they're servicing that hard dick. That's kind of how, <laughs> that's how I notice it works. Uh, I'm not hating. I mean, Hey man, you guys are right more often than not. You know, those, those are, those are, they're, they're chalky angles, but they're right angles, right? Uh, more often than not. So I ain't hating y'all. Y'all, y- y'all, y'all do better than me in more ways than one, right? So uh, believe me, I ain't hating, but I am gonna, but I will call out the the, the obvious trends, and those are obvious trends there. Uh, and again, I'm not calling it out really because I'm on the same side as you. I'm taking Panita even against my guy Cubby. So we'll see uh, if I pull the trigger. Six twenty for Torres, bet way out of range against Sam Hughes. Um, she was like a college and high school track athlete, so she's got crazy cardio. And was undefeated in kickboxing, whatever that means. Uh, take that for what it's worth. So essentially, we're gonna have a kickboxing fight on our hands. We'll see if Tisha Torres mixes it up on the ground. If she does, to get cute, or she's pouring it on, maybe she gets a finish late. Otherwise, uh, perhaps by decision. Um, you know, I, I don't blame people bet- betting the decision angle, but you never know with these short notice fighters, so it's it's always tricky. Uh, but you gotta find your angle. You gotta take a risky angle if you want if you want some action on that fight, right? So. I didn't, but good luck if you did. Gavin Tucker, plus 140, Billy Quarantillo. Billy Quarantine! Billy Quarantine, minus 160, Billy Q. Yeah, you guys can tell where I'm going. But I'm the fan of Gavin Tucker, man. He's just fighting my favorite guys, you know? Bias, Justin James, of course, that pick. I did tell y'all, you know, Gavin G. Tuck was a guy that I was high on before he came in. Then he styled in Cecilia, and I looked really smart and then he loses to a guy like Rick Glenn in a really bad way that aged very terribly and then he didn't fight for a while uh, so he just again recency bias and then you don't fight for a while it's the worst thing so then people like just hang the hat on there it collects dust um, that legend grows so you become even more suspect than you already were it's this whole unfair game that we play and sometimes those things end up being right I'm not supporting him here but at the same time I'm warning People completely overlooking him. Minus 160 seems about right. I don't want to play it. I want a more of a minus 150 or down to pay Billy Quarantillo. Um, because even though I always kick... Well, I have played third round before. I played him against Carlisle when it didn't hit. And then I think I forgot to play it against Kyle Nelson when it was so fucking obvious. But Billy Quarantine is like a mandatory round three guy. Um, and he could get a round three finish here. Gavin Tucker, if you put a pace, the pace that if he's not controlling the dance, he doesn't do well and can perhaps get hurt, can gas. In fact, he can get hurt by not only guys that, you know, hit hard like Justin Janes early, but, you know, he got hit, he got hurt early by, uh, you know, uh, Rick Glenn, who is a violence guy on the regional scene, but... This was an older, more riggedy Rick Glenn on the feet. Rick Glenn was more of a ground and pound in the clinch violence guy. You know what I'm saying? Uh, a lot of this was at distance uh, where he was initially getting hurt and tagged up on. Obviously, Tucker's gotten better since then. But the fact is, as stout, as healthy, as much as I like his unique personality, his style, all I love everything about Gavin Tucker, man. He seems like my kind of weirdo. Um, but let's be honest, he's not beyond being hurt, whereas Billy Quarantine even though he's been stopped just as many times on paper, 
Um, you got to keep in mind this guy's been fighting like heavy hitters at 55 on the regional scenes. Um, and, you know, uh, Billy Quarantine's got a good chin. He's shown that he can take hits, uh, come back, and knock out big hitters. He's done it on the regionals and uh, in his UFC career. Uh, you know, you don't want to fade a guy who I nicknamed Billy Quarantine. Uh, he's a really smart guy. I really like listening to him. He seems to do his rounds uh, as far as doing this kind of job. I think he could do this kind of job himself. He seems like he wants to when he's done. But he is not disillusioned where his focus is should be on fighting. He seems like a guy who's always training. He is not disillusioned who he's facing or who the stereotype that he gets as far as being a comeback fighter. And I like that he said that he's not relying on the comeback skills against a guy like Gavin Tucker. That he's not relying on getting Gavin Tucker out of there, which means he has to go for the finish and he has to go to winning rounds from the start. I love that attitude. So I will probably be looking to bet Billy Quarantillo here, money line, because I don't. I'm not sure I want to empty out on a decision or a round three or split my money into both. I don't feel that's as efficient if I can just play them straight up. Uh, but it will be competitive. I will be sweating, and so will you if you do play Billy Quarantillo. I'm waiting for a slightly better line. I would really would like him, Pineda, and even Ferguson um, minus 160 or preferably under if I'm going to play these guys. So that's where I'm watching to see uh, if it moves. Lastly, but not leastly, on my avoid list because I didn't tape this fight, Chase Hooper, minus 330. Peter Barrett, plus 270. Um, I'm going to pick Hooper, and I'm probably going to sprinkle on Barrett because the line is stupid. That tells you all you need to know about this fight, and that's probably everyone's opinion on this fight. Uh, if they did watch the tape, and I did not. So, uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that. All right, how did we do on time? All right, under an hour, I guess. That ain't too bad. Um... All right, top to bottom, taking Figueredo over Moreno, taking Ferguson over Oliveira, taking Dern over Jenny Droba, taking Souza over Holland, taking Ghani over DeSantos, taking Fiziev over Moicano, taking Pineda over Swanson, taking Torres over Hughes, taking Billy Quarantine over Gavin Tucker, taking Chase Hooper over Peter Barrett. Um, Didn't parlay anything. This is, seems like a car that's going to be real dangerous to parlay, folks. By the way, uh, again, straight plays, nothing official, but I'm going to look to play Quarantillo, Pineda, and F uh, Fiziev, possibly Ferguson, uh, depending on where those lines, if they go a little bit lower than where they are. Uh, props I did play. Uh, I took JDS Ghani over 1.5 minus 130 at 1 1.5 units. Uh, I took Figueredo Moreno over uh, 2.5 minus 105 at one unit. Took Souza by sub plus 225 at a half unit. Took... Tony and Chuck Olives under 2.5 in the co-main event for minus 160 at 1.5 units. Uh, avoid Hooper Barrett because I didn't tape study, but if you want to sprinkle on the dog there, I really don't blame you. Thank you guys again. Sorry for the energy, crappy voice, crappy impressions. Hopefully, uh, this was at least a decent reference to help you get through. Uh, and again, if you are feeling still generous, uh, you can continue to go hit that link. Thank you. I'll continue to read off, give you guys shouts and credits. Helps the show a lot. MixedMarshallAnalyst.com, the Amazon and Onyx click-throughs. No cost to you. Click through. Do your shopping. Your privacy is secured. Just kicks back a small percentage of your sale to this program, and it goes directly into it. Or if you really want to go directly into the program and into my good graces, Go ahead and hit the PayPal link that is safe and secure uh, right above those said banner links on MixedMarshallAnalyst.com. If you're listening on Apple iTunes, please give me a five-star rating and review. That is free. As well as YouTube, I, I'm sorry to keep bothering you guys, but man, if I could really get some some, some help on the subscriptions there, it is uh, looking pathetic. Daniel, Tom, MMA, give this video a like and hit the sub if you can. Thanks, guys. Uh, legitimately, good luck on your uh, picks and plays this weekend. Wishing you guys loves. Please stay safe. Uh, be kind. Cut the people who aren't being kind some slack. And always protect your neck.